Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. All right, well, I hope you're excited to jump back into 2 Samuel because that's exactly where we're going today. So if you have your Bibles handy, thank you, David, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3, we're going to jump back into our story. For those who have not been a part of our journey, I'll just catch up a little bit. Uh, 1 Samuel, to sum up, and this is a, a broad sum up. 1 Samuel is about the first king of Israel ever. This was King Saul. King Saul rose to power, started well-ish, uh, and then faltered and fell apart. And uh, his biggest failure was that he didn't follow God. And when he didn't follow the Lord, the Lord decided to remove him from his position and uh, God had already chosen another successor. He had chosen David uh, as a young boy at the time, now a grown man by the time we're going to talk about him today. And so uh, as David uh, was growing up, uh, Saul tried to kill him several times because even Saul realized God's hand was on David. And uh, after several failed uh, attempts, Saul and several of his sons are actually killed in battle. And so now is the time where David should be ascending to the throne. However, the uh, top military commander of Saul is a guy named Abner. Abner did not want to lose the power that he previously had enjoyed, and so he takes one of Saul's remaining sons, Ishbosheth, and he takes Ishbosheth and makes him king. And so um, the tribe of Judah, and if you remember, historical Israel is divided into tribes, the tribe of Judah made David king, and the rest of Israel that submitted to Ishbosheth, they followed him. And so you kind of have a bit of a battle going on within the heart of Israel as it is right now. So that's, that's where we are in our story. David, king of one tribe, the other tribe siding with Ishbosheth, Abner pulling the strings behind the scenes, trying to keep power on Saul's side of the family, and David trying to rise to power where he is. All right, so uh, here we are in 2 Samuel chapter 3. Starts right off catching us up in the story, and I think if you were to sum up what we're going to talk about today, you're going to talk about wealth, lust, and power. Those are the things that emerge as we study 2 Samuel, uh, wealth, lust, and power. 2 Samuel chapter 3. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. All right, so just starts off by saying, hey, listen, as you jump into this, you just need to know the power is shifting. So Saul's family had had all the power, all the stuff. David is now accomplishing more. And what's interesting to me about this is that David just has kind of one tribe on his side uh, and his men, and they're taking out everybody else. <laughs> they're fighting all their... And so I think, I take comfort in this. If God is on your side, it doesn't matter who's against you. If God is on your side, doesn't matter how big or strong you perceive yourself to be, if God is on your side, you're going to be victorious. And so here's little dot, David from little Judah, and they are taking on the rest of Israel, and they're winning. So uh, it's crazy. So there you go. Sets up the premise there. And then we jump right into verse 2. Verse 2. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel, and his second, Kiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, the third, Absalom, the son of Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrim of Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Now, before I go any further, for those of you that are pregnant or about to have children, you just saw a wonderful list of baby names. And um, I mean, I would love to meet your young Shephatiah at some point and, uh, and celebrate with you. So yeah, this is kind of weird. And it's weird in the story because it starts off like this. It starts off with like, hey, big battle going on in Israel, really important stuff going on. One side's getting stronger, one side's getting weaker. Hey, David had a lot of kids. Okay, back to the battle. So we're like, and it's like, what are we, what's with the kid thing? Why do we put that in here? So I think there's a reason for the kid thing. Um, it disrupts the flow, but I think the author has, has a point. The author, I think, is trying to say this. You need to know that David's house is getting stronger and stronger. So here he is, he's a king, so he's starting to have several wives. Um, and these wives are bearing him sons. Sons grow up to be warriors and leaders. Uh, those sons grow up to get married. When they get married, they produce their own offspring. And so David's kingdom is building. That's what they're saying right now, I think. They're trying to show us that there's a lot going on. Now, it's gonna be great if everything goes well. 
everything does not go well. It, it's not going to be great. These kids, like Amnon, you're going to hate him by the end of chapter 13. Kiliab is just going to vanish. Many scholars think he just died young. Absalom has a bigger role. You're going to read about him later. Uh, Adonijah does outlive his father. And Shephatiah and Egla, they just vanish from history. We don't even know what happened to him. So, you know, even though they pause to say, hey, he's building his family. Eh, we don't know how that all works out. And that way, do know, doesn't work out great. So, all right, back to verse 6. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. All right, so the pause here is to say, okay, listen, don't forget behind the scenes is Abner. Abner is the one who's really doing everything in the house of Saul. He's the one pulling the strings. He's the kingmaker. He's the power behind the throne. And I mean, we, we get it, right? I mean, it would be true today, but even historically, like the king can do whatever he wants, but the moment the general and the army are at odds with the king, the general's going to be in charge. Like, that's just how it works. Like the armies, they make all the, the, the power moves. And so here we are. And uh, now we come to this thing in verse 7 where we have this incident that occurs. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah. All right, let's pause there for just a second. Let's talk about concubines in case you can't define that right off the bat. It's probably an educational moment. Uh, let's define concubine. If I say side chick, does that communicate? Is that, it's your side piece, you know, whatever. I mean, it's not pretty. It's just, it is what it is, right? Does that communicate? You get that, right? So a concubine is typically a slave or a servant of a king who's like a wife, but not a wife, right? Now, this was accepted historically. It was. You, you would enter into this. Like, it would be like uh, the king coming to you going, do you want to be my concubine? And you being like, I will be your concubine. Meaning you will always have second class status. You'll never be recognized as a real wife. That even though David has multiple wives, you'll never be Abigail, right? Just like you will always be treated as a more common person who didn't have the privilege to enter into a genuine marriage with the king. That's, you'll be recognized that way. Your kids, however, will be considered legitimate heirs. So at least your kids are going to have a great future, but you're treated like, you know, like a second-class citizen. Um, so let me pause here and just say, women, you need to be delighted that you live in the day and age that, that you do right now with the power, the education, the jobs. I mean, right now, it's fantastic. It's a wonderful time for women. Historically, not so much. You were more like property. Most women were uneducated. Most didn't have jobs. Uh, and then when you started having babies, you were the one that was going to take care of them. That's just how it worked. And so if you've got a guy who's going to come along, and even though you'll be in a less than ideal situation, if the guy says to you, I'll provide you food, shelter, money, I'll help you raise your child well, I mean, if you're in a survival situation, you do what it takes to survive, even though in our civilized society, it's not that attractive. But that's, that's what was going on here. That was a concubine. All right, so let's go back to verse 7. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone in to my father's concubine? So I'm hoping I don't have to explain what going into the father's concubine means. Uh, I already had a hard enough time with concubine itself. So uh, this is really the turning point of the story. Now, apparently, if a king passed, the new king had the privileges of the old king's concubine. I don't know that I would want to date my dad's old girlfriends. I'm just putting that out there. There's something that sounds a little creepy about that. Um, and, and his accusation really is, Abner, are you making a play for the throne here? Are you trying to say you have some rights that you deserve some privileges? Do you think you should be king running this thing? Uh, all right, so that's, that's, that's what he's throwing down about. Let, let's pause for a second here. Before we go further, I've been asked this before. Did God endorse, did God allow multiple wives historically for his people? All right, that's a good question. All right, God did permit it, but it's not what he wanted. So let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter two, verse 24 says this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. All right, so this was God's design from the very beginning. Marriage was one man, one woman for life. That was God's, that's God's goal. All right, not the multiple stuff. In fact, there's even a comment made. This is a, a declaration by the Lord himself in Deuteronomy 17 to kings. So here's the declaration. 
only he, this is the king, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. All right, so let's understand the warning. The warning that God is giving to the kings of Israel, avoid power, lust, and greed. If you can avoid being consumed by those things, power, lust, and greed, you'll be a better king. Now, part of this too is just that, like, trust God to provide for you. You don't have to amass uh, huge uh, armies uh, with horses. You don't have to amass uh, great wealth. You don't have to have uh, all of these women to make you feel better about your life uh, and, and get lost in seeking pleasure. Like, that's not what this is about. And so God gives this very uh, direct warning to those who would be leading his country. But um, so again, God's preference, uh, his prescription, one man, one woman in the context of a lifelong marriage. Verse eight. Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth, And he said, am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day, I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers, to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David. And yet, you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman? All right, so this is, this is where I wish this was like a TV show or a movie because I think this whole scene would play out really well. I think this would be really interesting. Um, so Abner's claiming, hey, listen, I'm honoring your heritage, making your house powerful. I mean, Abner's just saying to Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth, you know, you wouldn't be here without me. And now you're accusing me of making a play for the throne. If I wanted the throne, I'd just cut off your head. Like, that was my words, not his. But like, that's... That's Abner. Abner is a seasoned warrior, and now this punk king is challenging him. Like, who do you think you are? He's like, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for me. And so I love that, and I love the passion of Abner. Now, truth being said, I don't love Abner. I, I know a bit about Abner from what I've read. I don't really like him, but I love this passion despite it being Abner. The idea of, of this, a fling isn't worth risking all that I have and all that I've been building. Now, we're gonna talk about lessons to be learned later, but can we pause and just acknowledge that a fling is not worth wasting all that I have and that I've been building. Let's put that out there as a public service announcement <laughs> for the people of God. Um, and I'm not sure about this whole thing about what am I, a dog's head of Judah? Like, I mean, it's not a phrase we use today. Culture changes over time. Uh, it's meant to be a derogatory thing. It's meant to be pejorative. It's meant to be like you know, some sort of a personal put down. Is this what you're saying to me? Although if he had my little Chloe's dog's head, uh, he'd be adorable. And uh, we'd be like, who's a good boy? It's you, Abner. You're a good boy. Um, but not that. This is not that. This is a, a very negative thing, uh, an ugly thing. So uh, Abner goes off, and then further, he's got some other things he feels like he'd like to say right now. Go to verse 9. God do so to Abner and more also. If I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. I know there's, there's some stuff going on here. Let's not miss it. So verse nine, God do so to Abner and more also. Now this is a common oath formula. You see it all over the Old Testament. That was their thing. May, may God do so to me and more. If I don't, you know, whatever. That's the oath. If I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him. Hold on a second, Abner. You knew all this time that David's supposed to be the king of all Israel? You've been fighting God. And Abner would be like, yeah, I have been because <laughs> power was involved. And now he's like, I'm gonna make it happen. All right, so here's, here, I'm gonna tell you, I, this is something I think is going on behind the scenes and I don't want us to miss this. I don't know that Abner has felt so betrayed in his dignity that he has now turned on Ishbosheth and is gonna side with David. I think Abner is an opportunist. That's what it is. And that's why he set up Ishbosheth to begin with, to try and get power and to build it up, hoping that Ishbosheth and he would be able to build enough, a big enough kingdom that they could overcome David, and they haven't. In fact, the opposite has happened. The, the, the transfer of power has begun. David's getting stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul is getting weaker and weaker. And I think Abner probably just said to himself, I'm going to wait for the next opportunity, and then I'm going to turn on that turkey and, and I'm going to go seek a better fortune because he knows if this thing continues, one day there will be a war that they can't win and he'll probably die. So he's like, you know what? I'm just going to side with my enemy. I'm going to, I'm going to turn things around 
tell David, I'll make a covenant with him and, uh, and go forward from there. So this is, this is my take on Abner anyway. Verse 12. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf saying, to whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me and behold, my hands shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. And he said, this is David, good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, uh, that is you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. All right, so they have this uh, discussion uh, through messengers, and he says, listen, we all know, David, <laughs> we all know, you're supposed to be the actual king of Israel. We know, I know that, you know it. I'll tell you, what, I'm going to help you do that. I will, I'll make a covenant with you, and I'll just help transfer all of these uh, the tribes over to you, and so all of Israel will be united under you. I'll be glad to do that. And then David says, that's great, just I want you to bring Michael. And if you haven't been traveling with us to this point, Michael was David's first wife who was given to him by Saul. It was one of Saul's daughters. And so Saul gave Michael to David as his wife and then took her back and gave her to another man. Like, oh, can you imagine? <laughs> You're a dude and the dad who gives the daughter away at the wedding takes her back later, gives her to somebody else. I mean, just the slight there. Now, uh, that was years ago. And uh, David since then has accumulated other wives. And so you might be thinking, David, you already have enough wives, but apparently you never get over your first, and so uh, he wants to get her back. And uh, if you're looking at this going, this is weird, this is messy, this is, ugly, like, it is. This, all, all this stuff we read in here with all these wives and concubines and relationships, it is, it is messy and weird, um, and I'm just so grateful that we live in a day and age when relationships and marriages just aren't messy anymore. I just, uh, praise the Lord. I mean, we've come so far, but I read these, and I... Like these sad people, these sad people. All right. Uh, so Abner uh, makes this proclamation. David says, that's great. Verse 14, then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, now Saul's son, saying, give me my wife, Michael, for whom I pay, paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. I'm not going to revisit all that. <laughs> it's, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, I did preach about it. If you'd like to hear that service, you can go back and listen to it online. Uh, children, please ask your parents about that. Um, and Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. All right, this is just a sad, <laughs> this is a really sad moment. This husband pleading, like, please don't leave me. Please stay. I love you. Like, it's a sad thing. It never should have been happening in the first place. They shouldn't even been set up to be her husband. So you look at this and you go, that's sad. Well, what was even more sad is that it all set up in the first place. Saul shouldn't have ever taken her, given her to this guy. And so it's just kind of fixing an old wrong, but it is, again, it's just messy and ugly and a little weird. All right, uh, verse 17. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel saying, for some time past, you have been seeking David as king over you. Oh, hold on a second. What? What was that, Abner? So not only does Abner know David should be king, the rest of these guys know David should be king as well. Like they've, they've been making it uh, under Ishbosheth, and maybe, maybe at the beginning they thought, all right, we'll keep riding with Saul's house for a little while. But whatever has happened, Ishbosheth has lost favor with the others of Israel. And so Abner comes along, he's like, hey, listen, we all know none of us like <laughs> Ishbosheth. Let's let David be king over us. You want that? I'm going to make it happen. I'll be your man. So he's trying to broker this deal. Again, if you don't see a more, uh, 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 a guy seeking his own well-being in the midst of a difficult situation, I mean, he's, he's kind of slimy a little bit, but Abner trying to, trying to work the deal here. So this is what he's doing. Um, all right, verse 18. Now then, bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all of the enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. So he's met with them. They've kind of agreed, like this sounds like a good idea. Let's move forward. Verse 20, when Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to my Lord, the king, and they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. So there's, there's another weird thing going on here, and it's something we actually have a little bit of familiarity with just historically as a country. And that is, what do you do when you've been at war with a country, 
and you've fought their people, and you've hated them, and they've hated you, and then you make a treaty of peace, and now we're all good again. Like, what do you, what do, you do with that? So I go back to World War II, just mentally, this idea that, you know, we, we hate the Germans, and the Germans hate us, and, I oh, man, I want them all to die, and they want us all to die, and then it's like, the war's over, and it's like, I love the Germans, let's go visit, you know, they make good food. Like, how does that work? Like, how do you get over that mentally and emotionally? That's something that's going on right here. Abner's the general of Saul's army or Ishbosheth's army in this case. They've been killing David and the Judites. I mean, like, how do you get over that? And it's like, okay, well, let's make a covenant. Let's fix things. And David's like, all right, let's fix things. Like, there's just something there that we don't live in that world. That's got to be a very difficult world to live in. Some people can work with it. Some can't, which is where we go now in verse 22 when we have another incident that is defining. Verse 22. Just then the servants of David arrived with Joab from a raid, bringing much spoil with them. All right, hold on. So Joab, now you have to have been reading with this through 2 Samuel to get here. So Joab is the general of David's army. He and his brothers fought with him in a recent war against Abner and his army, the army of Ishbosheth. And uh, it was a big rout, I mean, in the sense that David's side won the battle but Joab's brother, Asahel, was killed by Abner in that battle. And so he and his brother now are out for blood. So Joab, commander of David's army, his brother killed by Abner. All right, so he's returning now from a raid. Pick up, back up in verse 22. But Abner was not with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the army that was with him came, and it was told Joab, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said. So now it says Joab went to the king. I just want you to understand here, he's not just going to the king, he's coming in pretty hot. I mean, this is, they're going to have a direct conversation. So he runs in there and he says, what have you done? Oh, now hold on. We don't talk to kings that way. I don't care what generation you're in. You do not come into the king and challenge him to his face. What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. So now Joab comes in, says, listen, David, you're smarter than this. Uh, he's here to deceive you. You know that man's a spy. He just wanted to find out what's going on. All right, so now he comes in, he challenges the king, challenges him, bad decision and a lack of understanding. So uh, this is already a bad setup, but um, things get worse. Verse 26, when Joab came out from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner and they brought him back from the cistern of Sira, but David did not know about it. Now, before we go on, several times in here, we've already seen it a couple times. David sent him away in peace. He had gone away in peace. Several times in here, you're going to hear a reference to David not knowing what's going on and not being in on this. The author of 2 Samuel wants you to understand that David's hands are clean here. He just wants to make sure that's preserved in history. In regard to this, David is innocent. That's what he wants you to understand. All right, verse 27. And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Afterward, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had put his brother Asahel to death in the battle at Gibeon. All right, so um, there's a lot going on here. We've got this uh, curse that goes on by David. Um, I think we should review the curse. That's an interesting curse. Um, now, one thing you need to know is in the original language, in the Hebrew, all of the language here is masculine, meaning that the curse is not upon the whole family of the descendants of Joab. It's only on the male descendants of Joab. This is his curse upon them. One is, may you never be without somebody in your family who leaks. Who leaks in places you don't want to leak. That's what I wish upon your family. I also wish that you would never be without somebody who has a skin disease. I also want you to have men in your family who are condemned to do menial women's work. 
No offense to our ladies. It's just the curse that's upon him. Uh, So really, he's saying, I want men in your family to be emasculated, to be in positions that women would hold. All right, so that's a, a, a condemnation. I want you to always have men in your family who are dying in battle, and I want you to always have men in your family who are poor. This is David's curse upon Joab. All right, now before we go for let me just pause for a second. Um, I have heard from time to time, people will say to me things like, be careful what you speak because words have power. Now let me pause for a second. Words have power if God is in them. If he's not in them, they're just words. Right now we know the tongue is a spark and it can set a whole forest on fire. This is something we're reminded of in other scripture. And the idea is this, is that I can speak to you and I can build you up or I can tear you down. I can encourage you or I can destroy you. So in that regard, our words have power. But I don't have supernatural power. I can't speak to your life health and prosperity. Uh, I can't speak to your life condemnation. Now, if God's behind it and he's involved, then, then so. So like the thought is like, what is David doing here? I'll, I'll tell you what, exactly what David's doing here. David is just saying, I am so incensed that you betrayed somebody that I was forming a covenant with that I wish you would be condemned. It's, that's all it is. Just, I want you to be condemned. And it's pretty graphic. You know, how? I, I, here's how I wish you'd be condemned. I wish this and this and this. And, this. and the thing is, too, the people listening to David in this exchange are going to be sitting going back like, wow, David is really angry about this. He is really mad about this. That's, that's exactly what David wants people to understand. David's trying to say, like, I'm king here. You're, you're ruining my reputation as somebody who doesn't keep their, their oaths. And I'm so mad about that. And so this is what he's putting out there. Verse 31. Then David said to Joab and to all the people who are with him, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David followed the bier, and the bier is the, the rolling cart that carries the body of a dead person. They buried Abner at Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner, saying, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet were not fettered. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. And then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God do so to me and more also, if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them. As everything that the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner, the son of Ner. And the king said to his servants, do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, the sons of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. All right, so it's still messy. I mean, it really is messy because... Joab is David's nephew. He and his brother did something horrible. Uh, He stays in charge of David's army. Uh, They kind of get back to business as usual. Like it's a weird thing, but out of all of this, at least the people hopefully understand David was not involved um, in this horrible thing that happened. All right, so now we're kind of towards the conclusion of the story. It goes on, great stuff coming up in 2 Samuel. But this is maybe where we'll pause and talk about lessons learned, lessons learned. Now I do think as we watch God interact with his people, people respond to the Lord, we learn a number of things. And here, I think the thing we're learning, which we started with, is this, to avoid the traps of wealth, lust, and power. Like, and if we would change the wealth to greed, maybe. Avoid the traps of greed, lust, and power. And there's some foreshadowing that's going on here. And the foreshadowing is this. David is beginning to get caught up in the ways of the world. In this instance, he was innocent. But he's starting to be like other kings where he's amassing wealth and power and women. Uh, that's gonna be a problem. And this is quickly going to lead him down a dark path. And I would add, it leads us down dark, a dark path too, men and women. When we get caught up in pursuing uh, greed or lust or just power, like all of these things can take us down. So here's my encouragement to you. Uh, men, don't have multiple wives. <laughs> don't do that. And I know some women are saying, well, what, what about multiple husbands? Like, I get it. I mean, in your fantasy world, you would get so many chores done if you just had some more men working around the house. I get it. That's, that's how that works. But uh, that's not what God wants. We know from the very beginning, one man, one woman, the context of marriage. Uh, and for those who are thinking, well, like, we can't even have multiple uh, spouses anyway. Oh, hold on a second. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. Jesus is speaking. So the Pharisees come up to him to test him by asking him, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, 
Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So right there at the very, Jesus is saying, listen, I got to take you back to the beginning. You do know that God's design as, as spoken in scripture is one man, one woman, the context of a lifetime, lifetime commitment in marriage. That's what, that's what it's supposed to be. Uh, so they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now that's an interesting comment to me as well. Meaning that when you marry, and I mean, I know we can have all sorts of comments about who you're marrying, did you choose the right person, all that kind of stuff. But when you marry, it seems like God is, God's involved in this. And if God's gonna sign off on it, you're not supposed to mess it up. You're not supposed to tear it apart. So let man not separate. Uh, so then they said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus is really big on marriage, and he wants it to last. Um, and so I've, here, I'll let me just pause and say, this is, this is one of my encouragements to you. So when, when we hit this May, I will have been married 30 years. That's 30 years of marriage. Uh, yeah, I know. You can clap for my wife. She, yeah, you made it. Uh, good for you. I think my math is right. <laughs> By the way, she'll correct me later. Um, so, yeah, we got married in 94. I think that's right. So either way, um, marriage, for those who don't know, can be hard at times. <laughs> it, can, it can be hard. Like, even in a Christian marriage, you got two people that love Jesus, love each other, you know, a lot of great stuff going on. We've gotten to times in our marriage where it's been so difficult, we just haven't wanted to see each other, be around each other. This is true, just keeping it real. Uh, right now, we're in a great place. Uh, we've been to some dark places. Right now, we're in a great place. And, uh, and this is what I've noticed in marriage. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's great. Sometimes hard, sometimes it's great. That is just how marriage goes. If you are in one of those darker places right now, and you're thinking, I just don't know that I even want to do this anymore. Now, let me go back. When you married, God was behind the whole thing. So stick it out. If you will stick it out, things can get better. I was talking to a marriage counselor uh, about this recently. <clears throat> and he said to me, he said, you know, the thing is with couples, he says, they give up too quickly. If they would just stick it out, things will get better. They just can't see it in the difficulty. And so it reminds me too of something I've always said that, that people think marriage is like a one-way street and that you end up in a dark place. You're just like, it's over. We'll never get better. We don't love each other anymore. Let's just bail. Like don't bail. Turn the car around. <laughs> Go a different direction. If you will gut it out, you can get to a better place. And I do recommend marriage counseling and meeting with people and processing and reading great uh, books that talk about marriage. Uh, there are ways to get out of it. But if you'll stick it out, things can get better. It's when you give up that there's, there's no help. And I would just say this. Jesus said, please don't tear apart something God put together. So just an encouragement there. Uh, but not just the marriage thing. Uh, there's also a greed thing. Now, I bring up the greed thing because this has been a personal part of my journey uh, where God really, uh, I felt at one point confronted me. You're either going to live for me or you're going to live for money. Which do you want to do? And uh, I felt like God really put 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 on my heart. This is what it says. But godliness with contentment is great gain. All right? Pause right there. Here's what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's instructing his young protege, and he's saying this to Timothy. Timothy, if you'll learn to be content with what you have, you'll be the richest man in the world. This is my encouragement for you guys. If you'll learn to be content with what you have, you'll be the richest person in the world. You won't have to have more. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, right? The love of money, not money. It's not just money. This is the love of money, the, the craving to be rich. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the fear, faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So you know, one of the things to keep in mind is that if you just want to have money to have money to have money, that's when you're in trouble. And I just want more, and I've got to have more, because more is never enough. But if you can learn to be content, and this doesn't mean you can't get a different job, try to make more money, try to get a raise. Like, none of those things are inherently wrong. Just remember who you're living for. And if you're just living to amass wealth, then you might be in trouble already. 
Now, we're gonna go to a time of communion, and uh, communion is for all of God's people, whether you're a member of Sand Hills or not. Um, and communion is a reminder of what Christ has done for us. And we've just come through this with our celebration of uh, Good Friday and then the resurrection. That is that Jesus laid down his life so those who put their faith in him could be forgiven by God and not suffer the penalty that we are due. As a bonus, <laughs> if you will, uh, your life can be transformed. That the Holy Spirit of God indwells you and if you'll submit to him, he can change these passions and desires to amass the stuff of the world and give you really a heart to follow the Lord. So at this time, I want to invite the, the pastors and elders to come up to the communion table. And in a moment, we're going to distribute communion. When we do, there's two cups stacked on top of each other. Uh, so if you'll take them both together, one has the bread, one has the juice. Uh, and then if you'll hold them until um, I'll lead us through communion together. But let me pray for us. Lord, thank you uh, today for just the reminder of what it means to really live as one who's submitted to you. And Lord, we can be so easily tempted in this world to uh, seek power, to give into lust, to give into greed. Uh, that's normal and sometimes celebrated even in our society, but it's not celebrated by you. And so I would pray for us that you would work in our lives in such a dynamic way that we would submit ourselves fully to Christ just embrace what he has done for us on our behalf, the giving uh, of his body and his blood so that we could live forever. Lord, thank you for this moment in your holy name. Amen.